Good morning. I'm so glad you could be with me today in our continuing study in the book of Daniel in the Unfolding the Word series. We're in the midst of the sixth chapter now, uh, a new era in Daniel's life as the Medo-Persian Empire has taken over the region. Babylonia is no more. The Babylon Empire is gone. I'm going to pick up our reading today in verse 12. Uh, as we're looking at a point in time where Daniel is being attacked and subtly attacked to destroy him by the other leaders who were jealous of his influence. Verse 12, Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within thirty days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? And the king answered and said, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction that you've signed, but makes his petition or prayer three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind on how to deliver Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king a second time and said to the king, Know, O king, that it's a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. And the king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. Well, as you remember, the king Darius was going to promote Daniel yet to a higher position, the highest position, really, within the province. And the other leaders, jealous of his influence, sought to destroy him. Their first attempt, their first strategy, was to find something in his behavior or his, or his job performance that they could spin and try to assassinate his character, but they couldn't find anything. And then secondly, they decided, well, since that won't work, we're going to find something in his faith that will destroy him. And so they looked at his faith. But as they looked at the law of the land under the Medes and Persians, they couldn't find any law that conflicted with Daniel's faith. And so then their decision was, well, then we'll have to create a law, trick the king into signing it, and now we've got him. And of course, that's exactly what they did. And Daniel, hearing upon the new law, and you can go back and review what I've said previously on how all of those events unfolded, uh, saw that the law had been designed to trap him, to try to kill him. But he chose open defiance of the law and obedience to God as his strategy of response. And so now, seemingly, the enemy has won. And these opponents, these jealous leaders, now have evidence to bring to the king to force the king's hand. So as I was reading these verses today, verse 12 begins with that very coming before the king. But they were very subtle in the way they did this. <laughs> the very first thing they did as they came before the king was not to talk to the king about Daniel, but to turn the king's attention to the law that had been implemented and get him to affirm, yes, in fact, he'd agreed with the law, and he would carry it out, he would punish the offenders. I think the king didn't expect anybody to break the law. I mean, it would not have seemed like a big thing to have to privatize your faith instead of expressing it publicly. After all, what's 30 days without prayer is probably what was going on in his mind. By the way, let me stop right there. You know, sadly, for many people who profess Christ as Savior, 30 days without prayer would be no big thing, even privatized prayer, because many people seemingly go that long and longer without a meaningful prayer time with God. Well, anyway, separate issue. <laughs> the king wasn't expecting any issue here. So he affirms the law. Having affirmed it, then these conspirators come before him, and they say, King, <laughs> uh, Daniel has broken this law, and they gave him proof of it. 
You see, once they had con once the king had confirmed that the law was in force, then they had him. His open Daniel's open defiance of the king's law created an impossible situation for the king. Now, the king, it says in these verses I read to you, was distressed much and set his mind on how to deliver Daniel, verse 14. Here's an interesting thing, isn't it? King Darius, the new king, this one set by Cyrus, the emperor over the province of Babylon, was distressed and frustrated over the plot and thought, how can I deliver Daniel? Why? Because he cared about Daniel. Do you see the miracle of that? Here is this secular ruler. He saved Daniel back at the fall of the Babylonian Empire when all when Belshazzar and the other leaders were all killed. He put him into leadership. Now, because of his Daniel's great performance, he was going to put him even further. He actually cared about Daniel. God had given him a care for Daniel. God works in lives. And this is what was going on here. He cared about Daniel, and he saw the trap. And he, and he did not want to implement the death penalty in this case, but uh, he didn't have a lot of choice. So he spent all of that day trying to find a solution to rescue Daniel. Now, somebody might come back and say, well, if he really cared about Daniel, wouldn't he spend more than a day trying to solve this thing and trying to find a way to keep Daniel from being killed? Well, let me remind you of a truth of the Medo-Persian law. The Medo-Persian law, in operation at this point in time, a law that Darius was pledged to uphold, said this, if one has been convicted of a capital crime, a capital offense, they must be killed the day that it is confirmed. In other words, they brought it before when the evidence is clear and the judgment is made, they must be killed in that day. This idea of some extended stay in the, uh, in the execution region was not part of, of that law. It had to be done that day. Daniel's crime, now that the evidence had been confirmed, had to be responded to within that day. But at least the king had all of the day to try to find some solution. And the implication as we read through this is his distress. He was giving every ounce of thought as to how he could work around this law he'd been tricked into signing how he could still deliver Daniel. He knew he couldn't ignore the law. In fact, if it ever was true that the king would ignore the law, he would be killed according to Babylonian law, I mean Medo-Persian law, and the other advisors would know that if a king breaks the law, it sets the stage for anarchy within the system. They took the law very seriously. He knew he didn't have any choice there. So what would he do? Well, the leaders came back as the day unfolded. They knew that the king, now seeing the trap, was not willing to move forward with it if there was any other alternative. And so they gave him a little time, knowing there was no other alternative. And so they come to him again at the end of the day. They came by agreement to them after he'd spent this day trying to figure out how to deliver. And they said, listen, uh, the law, the law of the Medes and Persians, no injunction or ordinance the king establishes can be changed. So let's remind you, you've run out of time. This death sentence must be implemented. His crime had been confirmed by evidence, and now was the time to implement it. So the king, understanding there was nothing else he could do, reluctantly moves forward with the death sentence. He reluctantly, and underscore that word reluctantly, orders Daniel to be thrown into the lion's den. But it's interesting as he does that, he makes this statement, may your God whom you serve continually deliver you. Now that was not a defiant statement. 
you know, the Babylonian kings had said, what God can deliver you from the fire to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you remember back in chapter three. This is not that sort of statement. Now it's like, may the God you serve choose to intervene in what I can't intervene in. What an interesting statement from Darius. The king actually hoped that God would work a miracle. He hoped for a miracle. And yet, could God do it? Well, join me tomorrow as we continue to see this story unfold and how the hoped-for miracle actually was realized. God bless.